So I brought up talking about families because I want to tell you something with my kids. Uh, my kids look a lot like me. And you know that because my kids go to church. I, you know, one's back there running the sound right now. The other one is at home with his mom. But they look just like me. In fact, there was an app on Snapchat that had the face swap ability. So you could put my face on his body and his face on my body. And when you did that with me and my kids, you really couldn't tell the difference except for I have a beard and at the time they didn't. And other than that, you couldn't tell who was who. My kids look just like me. Um, and that's just a matter of genetics. January gets kind of mad sometimes because they have some features that look a lot like January, but for the most part, you know, I'm dominant in the genetics. But uh, that's just how they look. I want my kids to also act like me, and uh, genetics doesn't always play a part in that, right? I have to set a good example so that my kids would have something to follow, and then I'm just hoping that they actually see my example and follow my example. And of course, when I'm talking about my example, I want them to follow the things I do well, and I want them to overlook all the mistakes because my kids get to see all my mistakes too. Um, it's just how it is when you grow up in a house. You realize that your dad and your mom, they're not perfect, and you try to be, but uh, no, we're not. And so I guess what I'm saying is like kids will begin to take on the attributes of their parents. In our society, we, we kind of push them in other directions, you know, go find your own way, go to college. In the society that the Bible was written in, you were to follow your father's example because you were going on into that trade. And so you'd spend your life watching your dad as he did whatever work he would do. If he was a carpenter, you would most likely grow up to be a carpenter. And so watching your dad work and, and following your mom's example was the way that you grew up in the society that the Bible was written in. And so when we get to this section in Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to be encouraged. In fact, just look at it with me. Verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 5, it says this. It says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. And so when we move on to this section, that's how are we supposed to live? Because Ephesians, remember, is broken into two different parts. The first three chapters, how we went from darkness to light. The next three chapters, how to live as children of the light. And so in this section, we're talking about how do we live as children of the light? And Paul puts it pretty clear. You have to follow God's example, right, as his children. And that's really difficult when we realize that God is an invisible God that nobody can see, right? How do we follow an example of someone we've never seen? And then we remember the person of Jesus is the exact representation of God, right? So he's, he's our example. But we're his children. We're God's children, and therefore we have to follow his example. And that was begun to be talked about in chapter 1 when he said we are adopted into sonship, right? So we have to understand that y'all, all of us, are children of God. And as children, we need to look or imitate our Father, right? Because as we talked about, chapter 4, verse 32, talks about taking off this old self, which is being corrupted, and putting on a new self that is being, looks like God in holiness and righteousness. And so as Christians, all of us here, we, we, that when we decide, like, how do we live a life that God has called us to live, we have to understand, first and foremost, we have to be and act like God. Sounds easy enough, right? You guys have all failed at it already, right? You've been trying, I'm sure, but this seems like a task that's, that's just too hard to accomplish. And how do we get there? How do we follow God's example? And uh, I think when I, when, when I look through this text, we're going to go through 20 verses today, verses 1 through 20. I, I'm going to see four things that is about how we're supposed to live. And I think when we live this way, we begin to look a lot lo more like our Father, which is who we want to look like, right? Our Father. And uh, Paul will point that out, that we have to follow his example. So maybe the first thing that you could think about, and this isn't my first point, but I just want to point us back to where we were last week. In, verse 30, in, in the last verse of uh, chapter 4, verse 32, it says this, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So the therefore, you know, follow God's example, therefore, is pointing us back to this verse saying, if you want to follow exa God's example, if you want to be like God, it starts with being kind. You guys got that one down? Compassionate and forgiving, just as in Christ, God forgave you, right? Kind, compassionate, forgiving. That's us. 
That's Christians. We are following God's example in that. And sometimes we're great at it, and other times we struggle with it. And sometimes I'm on the struggle bus, I'll just be honest, right? But sometimes we're great at it. As we go through verses 1 through 20, we're going to find four things. And the first thing, following God's example, we follow God's example by walking in love. That's the first thing. Just write that down real quick. We follow God's example by walking in love. See, here's what it says in verse 1 and 2. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. So we have to follow Christ's example and walk in this, this way of love, right? And he uses the word walk, which is the same word he used earlier about living. See, the word, the Greek word for walk can be translated in walk or living or doing. It's about the way that we live our life. And one thing that should stand out about Christians is that we need to walk in love. And uh, it's easy to love those people that love you, right? Like that, that comes natural to us. I don't even have to explain what it is to love your, your father, mother, or your brother, or your sister. Those things come just really easy. But it's harder to love those people that are, are more difficult, our enemies, right? Do we have that down? Yet Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why? So that we can show ourselves to be children of the Father who sends the rain on the just and the unjust, right? God provides for both. He loves both. I mean, there'll be punishment that comes, but uh, God is, is providing. He's loving. And as his children, we're supposed to also be loving. And there's no greater example of love than in the person of Jesus, right? He is the one who showed us what love is. I heard this story about a monk who, who uh, wanted to bring people in to teach on the love of Christ. And so he, brought, he said, I'm going to have this service at night. And uh, he brought everybody into to the monastery and he turned off all the lights and he just took a candle and he, he moved it across the cross. And, and uh, you could see, you know, the, the nail marks. And then he blew out the candle and he just walked away. That was his study on the love of Christ. Just look at the cross, look at what he's done for you, and you'll know the love of Christ. Now, the, the challenging thing, because that's, that's, that's when we think about the love of Christ, the challenging thing is, is that we're supposed to somehow follow his example and act that way towards other people. And it's something that he did on his own. What makes this first unique is it's kind of different from the John 3.16 language, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Look at this way, the way it says, says it about Jesus. It says, um, it says, as dearly loved children, walk in love just as Christ loved us and gave himself. Right? It's the, it's, sometimes we talk about this as God giving his son. But Jesus wasn't without, without uh, he had the opportunity, right? He, this is Christ giving himself. They're both in it together, right? And, and we're supposed to follow that example somehow in, um, in giving ourselves up as an offering and a sacrifice to God. See, this is, this is Romans language that when we consider what Christ has done for us, our response is what? to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. So not only are we following Christ's example of love, but we live in a self-sacrificing way as well, right? That's something we're supposed to be doing. See, Jesus was the, the sacrifice once for all. He took his, his offering into a better, better altar in, a better, in heaven, right? That's Jesus, the sacrifice once for all. But now we're commanded to also give ourselves as sacrifices following his example, right? Here's, here's a verse that points this out in Hebrews. It's Hebrews chapter 13. And it talks about this sacrifice that we're supposed to do just as Christ sacrificed. In Hebrews chapter uh, 13, verse 15, it says, through, through Jesus, or actually at verse 11. What verse did I have up there? Oh, yeah, 13 verse 15, it says this. Though Jesus, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips that openly profess his name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. So we are following Christ's example of sacrifice, of love, and we are people who walk in love, right? 
offering to God ourselves, the fruit of our lips, doing good to those people around us because that's the kind of life that pleases God. So there's my first point. My second point is that uh, we have to walk away from darkness. And a lot of the imagery in Ephesians chapter 5 has to do with light and darkness. Right? In fact, light and darkness has been a big theme throughout all of Ephesians. Remember in chapter 2, God you know, made the eyes of your heart be enlightened so that you may see the power that you have. Right? And then he goes on to talk about light and darkness throughout. In chapter, in chapter 5, verse uh, 3, it says this. It says, but among you, this is chapter 5, verse 3, but among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people, nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which is out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath be- comes to those who are disobedient. Do not, or therefore, do not be partners with them. See, this is all a life descriptive of darkness. And we're to have nothing to do with this. See, I, I was praying through this scripture this week, and um, the first part really like hit me because it says, among you, there should be not even a hint. Right? And then he lists all these problems. And some of them, like, they're they're there like in in everybody's life there's these sins that we deal with and and yet Paul is saying there shouldn't even be a hint of these things and so there's been conviction through the week as as I think about coarse joking or foolish talk you know like how how there's conviction in that and then I realized that I have to remember that the you in this is plural right and it's y'all and what he's talking about, this, is, this goes into the idea of what kind of church are you going to be part of? Because we're all sinners in need of this Savior, right, who willingly offered his life for us. And we're all on this journey trying to overcome sin. But we should not be part of a church that there is even a hint of sexual immorality, right? And this has been big in Paul's day because in Paul's day, he was writing to a Roman people that, every area of their life in worship would have involved some type of sexual immorality element to it, or idolatry, or greed, right? And in fact, the Corinthian church begins to struggle with this a little bit, where they want to bring in the same sexual practices that they see outside the church into the church. And Paul says, you know, cast them out. The point is that there shouldn't be inside our church a hint of these kind of things going on. We know that that people in the church struggle It's not like we think that we are perfect people, but it certainly, our sin certainly shouldn't showcase what happens in church every Sunday, right? We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be light and not darkness. And so he says there shouldn't be even a hint of this inside, right? Among you, there shouldn't be a hint of sexual immorality of any kind or impurity or of greed. And I thought greed just stuck out there because why is he talking about money when he's also talking about sex? Wait, like, what's going on here? And, it, and it's because that word greed doesn't always have to have to do with money. It's about this desire for more. And so it can also apply to sexual immorality. And that's out of place for God's people. It, it doesn't fit. Neither does obscenity or foolish talk or coarse joking. But those things don't fit either. And that's the part that brought more conviction to me right? Because, you know, the way we talk kind of represents what's going on in our heart, right? That's, that's the way that it happens. It starts in our heart. It comes out of our mouth. And before you know it, that's our actions. And what Paul is saying is inside, like, this shouldn't be what, what is happening in your church. We've, we've had people leave this church for just some of the most oddball reasons I can think of. Like, just foolish stuff, right? I would leave a church that promoted sexual immorality. I would leave a church where there's coarse joking and and foolish talk by the people of, like if you were on stage saying this kind of stuff, I would leave that church, right? And that's what he's talking. That's out of place for God's people. You're in Christ. You should be different. 
understanding we all struggle with sin and we shouldn't have that in our life either, but that's the process that we're going through. But we certainly shouldn't be part of a body that's like that. And that's out of place. And I think we could even, if we're talking individually, we could even extend this out into a category that Paul had no idea of. He could say something like, among you, there should be no coarse retweets or foolish memes, right? I mean, the way that we talk to one another, not just on, in person, but online or in email or uh, through Facebook, the way we talk about other people, that's out of place for God's people. I'll tell you what is in place for God's people, because we should walk away from darkness. Here's, here's what he says in uh, verse 4, nor should there be obs obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which is out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Like, what, what our lives should be like is about showing gratitude instead of talking foolishly, right? And just, this, just as we came into church tonight, I was having two conversations about, like, we can grumble about things or we can be thankful about things. But what happens when we're grumbling about things is we begin to um, foolish talk, coarse joking. We become, to become discontent. But what if instead we approach situations with gratitude and thanksgiving? We, we wouldn't be so discontent. We wouldn't be so unhappy. And there are a lot of people today that just seem unhappy. We were talking about this just the other night in the Tuesday Bible study. And I know why they're unhappy. They're saturated with filth instead of focused on God. And if you would just focus on, on Scripture and get rid of the foolish talk and the coarse joking and, and all of these other things, but live a life with thanksgiving, you're going to find a life that's truly satisfied in one, instead of one that is angry all the time. That's how we, we live more like God. We, we follow Jesus' example. We walk in love and we stay away from darkness. He goes on to say that uh, no one deceive you with empty words. Because of such things, God's wrath has come. Therefore, do not partner with them. Like there's a group of people that we are supposed to stay away from. And Paul is not saying that, that we can't. Partnership is what he's talking about. Even in this culture, if you were going to work in some kind of guild or some kind of trade, often that was associated itself with some kind of pagan god. And so Christians in this time, was, they were struggling with, how do I live this life? I've been a carpenter, but the trade that I'm in requires a sacrifice to this pagan god. How do I continue to live? That's what Christians are dealing with. How do I continue to conduct business in a marketplace or, or live in the community without giving up what I believe is, is valuable? And the one thing that Paul would say is that in the church, you shouldn't be compromising. Now, outside of the church, you're going to have to deal with people. In fact, he says this in, in Corinthians chapter, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, he says this. Um, or don't you know that, no, it's actually chapter 5, verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexual immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or the greedy, or the swindlers, or the idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave the world. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy or idolater or slander or drunkard or swindler. Do not even eat with such people? So there's a difference between how we interact with people inside of this church and how we interact with people as we deal with them in the grocery store. When we, we see people in the grocery stores, we treat them the way Jesus treated sinners and tax collectors. Inside the church, there should be a little bit of a difference. Anyway, um, my, my third point is that we need to walk in the light, right? So we're walking in love. We're walking away from darkness. We're not even partnering with, with people who live those lifestyles. And we're walking in the light. And this verse is what sums up the, the whole book of Ephesians, or the letter of Ephesians. It's verse 8, and this is what it says, For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. 
live as children of the light. That's us. Like Paul has explained how we've gone from darkness to life. That was the first three chapters. Now we're supposed to live as children of the light. Again, that same word for live is also walk or do. It's, it's the way that we're supposed to conduct ourselves as if it represents light instead of darkness. And that's just a biblical metaphor for light representing godly things and darkness representing evil, right? And, you know, it's, it's obvious that, that uh, sin usually happens in the dark. We try to conceal it, as opposed to a, a godly life, which is lived before everyone. We can all see it. And that's kind of the, the double standard. But... Paul in this text says that God has made us light in the Lord. And that's our identity. We have to accept that, that we are light. And I know we don't like to talk about works as a, as a way of righteousness because there's no work that could, can make us righteous. But as children of the light, we have to live like it. Right? That seems to be a requirement. It's a command, an imperative. Live as children of the light. Therefore, if you call yourself a Christian, imitate your father, follow Jesus' example, live in love, stay away from darkness, and walk in light. That's us. Now, there's fruit. We, all, we like to talk about fruit of the Spirit. There's fruit of light. You see, because just as God or a farmer will go out and sow seeds, he expects a harvest. When God has brought us from death to life, from darkness to light, he expects something out of us. And this is the fruit of light. It's in verse 9. For the fruit of light consists of goodness, righteousness, and truth. So if you are light, you should look like these three things. You should be good. right? And he's shown us what is good and what the Lord requires. He wants us to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. It's not hard to figure out what good is. We pick up the scripture and we find the definition. God has shown us what is good. And if we are children of the light, then we should be good, at least attempting to live a good life, to be righteous, right? And righteousness has this idea of of being in good standing with. And we should be righteous because we're in good standing with God, following his decrees and his laws, right? That's the way that we live our life. Now, there's no one righteous, I mean, ultimately, we've already failed at that. But now that we've gone from death to life, from darkness to light, we should be attempting to live this righteous lifestyle that attempts to be in good standing with God instead of in darkness. He goes on to talk about truth, and Jesus says, you know, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. If we are children of the light, this fruit should be on our tree. This fruit should be descriptive of the person that you are because you are in the light. And he goes on to talk about, verse 10, it says this, and find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful to even mention what the disobedient do in the secret, but everything exposed to light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated becomes light. I want you to just take a second and consider this verse, not as it applies to what everyone else does, but the things that you do in secret. Because I'm sure that if you brought them into the light today in church, shame might be the word that uh, you use. If you were to, to expose the way that you talk to one another in your family or the things going on in your life, if you were to expose that today, I'm sure shame would be something that comes to mind, right? So instead of pushing this verse on everyone else, take a second to to internalize it and understand that when we take the things that make us ashamed and expose them to the light, they become visible, and everything that becomes visible becomes light because Christ can redeem We need to take those things that we're ashamed of and expose them. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, come and like lay all your sins bare, but maybe turn them over to God. Maybe say, God, I'm, I'm dealing with this because here's what I think about sin that usually we're ashamed of. When it's dark out, that sin looks pretty attractive. 
But once that light comes on and you're caught in it, that sin looks foolish, maybe even shameful. That's why we expose it to light. Because light is what takes it from darkness. Like Jesus is the light. He's the one who's brought us from death to life, from darkness to light. It's all summed up in these words that Paul says in verse 14. And I don't know where he gets this from. He just says, this is why it is said. So maybe it's an Old Testament text, but it's hard to pin down one text that says this. So it's probably a saying that was was happening inside of uh, the early church. So you guys get to look back at early church sayings. That's kind of cool. But here's what he says. This is why it's said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. That's us. We were asleep, but we've been awakened in the Lord. We were dead, but now we're alive. We were darkness, but now we're light. And how did that happen? We rose from the dead when we were united with Christ, and he's now shining on us, shining through us. That should describe the type of life that you live. So we should be walking in love, following Jesus' example. We should be staying away from darkness because darkness has no place with God's people. And we should be people who shine light. My last point is that we walk in wisdom. And here's what he says. Be very careful then how you live. This is verse 15. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most out of every opportunity because the days are evil. See, we're supposed to be living this life that is wise instead of foolish. The fool says in his heart, there's no God, but wisdom, right? That's, that's following after God. That's living according to God. That's what it means to be wise. And so we should live as wise people, walk in wisdom and make the most out of every opportunity. I got to be honest, I don't always do this. I love a good Netflix binge, right? Like it happens. I spend a lot of time doing things that are really like futile in the end. But instead, I should be more careful because like the days are evil and I need to make sure that I am making the most out of every opportunity. And here's how we do it. It, it says, because the days are evil, verse 17, therefore do not be foolish, but understanding what the Lord's will is. Don't get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like, there's so much there that I just have to skip over because there's timing issues. But the point is, you want to walk in wisdom, then be in a community that promotes light instead of darkness. If you want to walk in wisdom, make the most of every opportunity to allow light to shine on you. Speak to one another. See, it takes community to be light in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Encouraging one another all the more as we see our, the day approaching. This is the pattern that the early church set for us, right? They met continually with glad and sincere hearts, right? They fellowshiped with one another, breaking bread, prayer. There was no need among that early church because they made the most out of every opportunity. They were wise. The question is, how are you living? I think it's, it's easy to get distracted and slowed down. I, I ran a race this week and I did really well for the first few miles. And then at the end, I was going to run faster. And then I just ran into all these people that slowed me down. I just, I came to a stop almost. It was hard. I had to like swerve around them. The way I got through them was by being intentional and making the most out of every opportunity, right? To live as a wise person. I'm, I'm going to stop there. Um, but I just want to encourage you that if you want to walk in a way and follow God's example, then be a person of love. Stay away from darkness. Project light to the world and live in wisdom, which is to follow after God and his way. We're going to sing a song of invitation. It's number 903 in your hymn.